Now, five years ago to this very day, President Reagan called a press conference to announce that he had fired one of his top advisers. The story behind that very public sacking is only now emerging. It involved arms smuggling, hostages and the shady world of political double dealing now known as Iran Gate. Here to give us his version of those dubious events is one of its key figures. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colonel Oliver North. Please for me, sir. Now, I introduced you as uh, uh, Colonel Oliver North, I guess. Are you a retired Colonel? or you... uh, Lieutenant Colonel, or as you would say, Lieutenant Colonel. And you still hold that office? Retired. Retired. Now, now uh, as I mentioned, this is the fifth anniversary of when you were sacked uh, very publicly by President Reagan. When you look back on that, how do you feel now? Are you bitter about that event? Oh, I don't think so, Jonathan. Life's uh, far too long to be bitter for long. I'm a, I'm a follower of an unemployed Jewish carpenter who tells me that I'm supposed to forgive my... Uh, adversaries. Unfortunately, I can't forget their names. Now, uh, one thing that you're very much in the news in this country for at the moment is uh, your involvement with Mr. Terry Waite, and people are obviously very keen to try and find out what actually took place uh, leading up to Mr. Waite being taken hostage and what your involvement with him was. Um, many reports this weekend have suggested that Terry Waite was a stooge for both you and the American government, that he was being used in ways that he didn't understand. Um, what, what, what is your side of the story? Well, Jonathan, I think that that portrayal diminishes a man of uh, courageous Christian compassion. He's a man who was involved in those kinds of activities well before I ever met him, and uh, Lord willing, will be again. Uh, he is a man who uh, was able to do things that my government uh, couldn't do, and that was to establish direct contact with those who held the hostages. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, for that, uh, we ended up getting three Americans freed. Now, you say we ended up. Well, as I said, the speculation this weekend was that actually the fact you were probably much more important and much more involved in that due to the fact that you were trading arms in return for the hostages and that Mr. Waite really um, was little more than someone to help arrange meetings and allow them to talk to the American government without that being as public as they uh, feared. Well, I, I'm of the belief that uh, none of those three men would be free except for Terry Waite's involvement, that the people who took the hostages, as well as their mentors in Tehran, very much wanted to have someone, uh, a Terry Waite, if not the Terry Waite, involved in, in the uh, release of those people, and I don't think it would have happened without him. Did Mr. Waite know nothing about the, about the arms being exchanged? Or? He certainly didn't know it from me. See, it does, it strikes one as uh, surprising that he's had, because I know he'd had many, many meetings with you, I believe some like 20 meetings. I, I'll leave to others to count them up. And so he, uh, what were those meetings about then? Well, we'd certainly met on the hostage matter. I mean, he was introduced to me as a man who had been engaged in those activities before in Uganda and Libya, a man who was deeply concerned about the fate of the Western hostages and others in, in Beirut and the Middle East, and who was engaged in that effort and could be helpful, and I believe that he was. Uh, the fact that I did not uh, apprise him of exactly what our government was doing with Iran, I think, protected him rather than jeopardized him. But do you not think him going into situations, I mean, very, very dangerous situations, as we found out, uh, with none of that knowledge, do you not think it would have been kinder, if nothing else, of you to let him know in advance uh, so that he could then make his decision with all of the information, whether to return? Well, in point of fact, I think it probably would have jeopardized him more uh, to have known all of the details of what my government was doing, even before I got involved in it. Do you feel responsible in any way for his imprisonment? Not at all. I think the people who are responsible for his being held captive for five years are those who took him rather than those of us who prayed daily for his release. Now, you mentioned earlier um, the, the fact that you were a follower of, uh, I believe you said, an unemployed Jewish carpenter. I assume you're referring to Jesus there. Um, your faith is something that you, you've talked about often. It's obviously very important to you, central to your life. Now, one thing I've always wondered when I've heard military men such as yourself talking about Christianity is how you reconcile the fact that you're dealing, as in fact you were, with weapons of mass destruction uh, items that are going to result in the death of, of men, women and children with the fact that, that you, you claim to be a Christian? Well, I, uh, I would cite to you uh, the passage in Matthew, the Gospel, where a uh, Roman centurion, a captain uh, in all essence, comes up to Christ and says, please heal my servant, please don't even come to my home, I'm not worthy. And Christ turns to the twelve that have followed him all over Galilee and says to them, look, uh, greater faith than this in all Israel I've not seen, and heals his servant. He doesn't say, well, uh, I don't do soldiers, or I don't do people who work for the occupying army. He heals the servant. And uh, I think that's a, 
in as much as what's not said. He doesn't say those things that I just described. He heals the servant. But if we look at what he does rather than what he says, he is healing, whereas you are aiding people to kill. Quite to the contrary. My mandate was to save lives, not take them. Uh, certainly saving hostages is a, a worthy goal, whether one's in the military or one is a compassionate Christian like Terry Waite. And uh, I believe that my service to my country as a Marine would uh, bear witness to the fact that I saved a lot of lives. Now you're talking about saving the hostages, of course, but one of the things that caused uh, so much attention to be drawn to the events were the fact that some of the profits you were making from the arms transactions were then being uh, given to the Contras in their fight against the Sandinistas in, in Nicaragua. Uh, now, what, the why were you doing that? Why were you aiding the Contras? Well, starting in 1980, my government, before I went to the White House, began to support the Nicaraguan resistance. Starting in 1981, the Reagan administration decided not only to support them, but to support the Afghan resistance, the Angolan resistance, the Cambodian resistance, all of which were aimed at bringing down communism. And that point of fact, it succeeded. Now, 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 now why? are you so obsessed with bringing down communism? I mean, the, the, the Sandinista government, they were democratically elected. That was a fair election. Actually, what, what right does America have to go in there and well, try and... Uh, not to correct your sense of history, Jonathan, but they weren't. They took over in a very bloody war and ended up murdering the former despot. Political, not to observers, excuse. political observers from the... I mean, the, the despot was killed many years later in, a, in Costa Rica, I believe. Political observers in this country saw it as a, as a fair election and saw them as a justifiable and democratically elected government. Jonathan, I, I don't mean to challenge your, your great sense of history, but that's incorrect. Okay, well, well if we were to say that was incorrect, you're, you're aiding the communist, you're, you're trying to rather to end the communist regime. Why do you want to do that? What do you want to put in this place? Well, what the Reagan administration decided to do as early as 1981, as I said, was to support anti-communist resistance movements all over the world. And we did so with Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Nicaragua. The theory being, and I think accurately reflected by what's happened in world events, that if you could start that decolonization process, you could bring down the whole communist house of cards. Indeed, the events in the last decade have proven that to be accurate. But I still have a problem with when I meet Americans often, as, and it, it strikes me that there's a, almost a degree of bigotry involved here, why it is that you can't tolerate another political regime, a different ideology existing in the world, why it has to be what you see as, as the American way. Well, I don't think it was just the American way. If I remember properly, there was a, a certain Margaret Thatcher who actually preceded Ronald Reagan to, as a uh, conservative, anti-communist leader uh, who believed, as he did, that uh, communism was a fatally flawed system whose days were numbered. But that's by the by, whether or not you should actually then go in, if it's days are numbered, then let it play its course, rather than go in and aid people, give them weapons, give them money. Well, except for the fact that that system was a threat to the democracies that we are pleasantly ensconced in here as well as the one on the other side of the Atlantic. But at the same time, I believe that the American Congress introduced several amendments uh, forbidding you from actually supplying the Contras with anything other than humanitarian aid. Uh, now, you acted contrary to that, and therefore, surely, you were subverting democracy in, in your own country. Actually, Jonathan, what our Congress did in a remarkable act of uh, gutless uh, legislation is simply said that we could no longer use our tax dollars to support the resistance. They didn't forbid the president to go out and ask the Saudi government for help, which he did, ask the government of Taiwan and the government of Brunei, uh, private Americans, or to use the profits of the sale of arms to the Ayatollah to support I, I, the resistance. I've read those amendments, and I don't read them to be anywhere near as specific as that. I, well, I, was, I, would, I would encourage you to read my book, Jonathan, which I, has in it the actual, uh, the well, actual well, text of them. Mr. North, I read your book, and I found the conclusions you leapt to to be very, very curious ones indeed, to be quite frank. It well, did seem to me like that was the argument being written before the facts had been absorbed. Well, I, actually, I, I actually wrote down the actual texts of those so-called Boland amendments. Yeah so that people could understand them. And it's perhaps. on the same page, and I read them, and I still, for the life of me, couldn't see how you came to the conclusion that you're telling us now. Well, here, it, because the most egregious of them simply said that no funds made available by this act could be used for the purposes of supporting the Nicaraguan resistance. Right. It didn't say that the president, in his role as head of state, couldn't reach out to other sources for that aid. Just because it didn't say that doesn't mean that it gives him permission to do so, surely. Actually, that's the way the laws work. And uh, if the law says the speed limit is 55 in America, then it means you can't go 56. But yeah, it I, says I, you can go I, 55. Even with my limited historical knowledge, I can grasp that. But what, what I'm trying to put to you is the fact that, the, uh, and certainly after the event, I think you would bear me out, the fact that it was shrouded in so much secrecy 
and the fact that the Reagan administration was keen to disown you as quickly as they did, surely reflects the fact they were aware of the illegality of their actions no. and the fact that it was a non-democratic act. No, actually, I think they were more concerned about the political consequences of it, Jonathan. Uh, no one that I dealt with in the entire time I was at the White House ever once mentioned illegality. They simply mentioned the fact that they were very concerned about the politi political consequences of it. And indeed, that's how I saw it. But presumably, they're not going to go around saying, hey, let's do something illegal. I mean, they're not going to use those terms anyway, are they? Well, I, again, never dealt with any illegal orders, nor did I give any. But you were operating in a covert way. You were, you were operating in a cloud of secrecy. Jonathan, secrecy does not necessarily mean wrong. Your, Her Majesty's government has people who operate in secrecy against the IRA, against uh, various foes of, of this country. And uh, our government does the same thing. Even in a democracy, secrecy does not necessarily connote wrongdoing. There have to be secrets for democracies to preserve themselves. One of the things I think that struck people at the time was, was the fact that uh, there seemed to be more interest in whether President Reagan knew of all your actions uh, than in actual fact whether those actions were politically correct and, as I said, legal. Um, do you consider that was a smokescreen and do you consider that you were used as a scapegoat? Well, as I clearly indicated in my book, uh, I believe that I was made a political scapegoat, that it became a matter of criminalizing the political differences between a very strong conservative president and the very liberal leadership of our Congress. And that, unfortunately, uh, they chose to allow those to be criminalized. The charges were eventually either dismissed by a jury or thrown out by the judge, uh, I think vindicating that position. There was um, talk in some things I read of, of money that was raised um, by the sales of arms to, I guess, to aid the... Uh, the uh, contrast found its way into several people's accounts, yours including? Not so. So you did not profit in any way? From no, I, I did not. I did accept a security system for my family because I was threatened by Abu Nidal, one of the world's most brutal terrorists, at a point in time when I was preparing to leave for Tehran, and a security system was installed at my home. I was appropriately, I suppose, uh, cautious about my, the fate and safety of my children. Abu Nidal has been known to machine gun them in places like the Rome airport. And I thought that that was a prudent course of action. Do you have, you mentioned at the beginning that you said that uh, a lot of time has passed and that maybe you shouldn't uh, harbor bitter feelings. Do you regret your actions at any time during the period leading up to your, your dismissal? Jonathan, I think anybody who has gone through uh, more than a few minutes of life in, uh, in maturity looks back at things that they would have done differently. And I'm certainly no different. I understand full well that I'm a frail, flawed, mortal just like you and just like this audience, that I've made mistakes. I think I've acknowledged those mistakes fully and clearly in my book. I think that uh, on reflection, there are certain things I would have done differently. But I still would have uh, done what I could to support the Nicaraguan resistance and still done what I could to get hostages home and free. Interesting to meet you. Uh, Mr. Oliver North, ladies and gentlemen. Take some time out here after the break. The twin phone thanks to Victor Lewis Smith and Paul Sparks, plus Twin Peaks Cookie Star Kimmy Robertson. Stay tuned.